Hi everyone. The original idea for this video was I was going to look at several examples of left-wing propaganda, briefly touching on their arguments. The idea is some of the propaganda pamphlets and zines I've collected over the years from various radical groups are much more interesting than others. Well, this one started out as what I thought would be a more boring one, but as I started to read it, every sentence just got more and more intense. You might say that the pressure gauge on the boiler was about to blow us sky high, straight out of the boring pile and into the solid gold stratosphere. The very air we breathe is pure cringe gold emanating from this beautiful, astute piece of writing. From the wilds of America, analyzing the idea of British colonial America in steampunk by Eileen the Peacemaker, brought to you by Madame Rody's Traveling Info Shop. Prologue. When I first became interested in steampunk last year, I posed a question to one of my friends. Me. So, dot, dot, dot. I was wondering about steampunk. Where does colonialism fit in? Okay. <laughs> okay, if you old timers don't get it, let me help you out. Steampunk is pretty much some combination of ideas from different time periods, like futuristic technology powered by steam in a Victorian England-esque setting. Steam Boy is the best movie I've seen inspired by the genre, but it's also a cosplay fan fiction thing. It doesn't have to be futuristic technology in Victorian England, but that's the most common type of thing I've seen. And pretty much, it's gone the way of disco pants already. So, our author, Eileen the Peacemaker, is grappling with the ethical dilemma of colonialism in a fictitious fantasy world subgenre mostly popularized by cosplayers. These people are imagining an alternate history as a backstory for their costumes, and it's not like there is even something like the Lord of the Rings that you could point to and say, oh, this is the thing they are all geeky about. Steampunk is a bit more hazily defined. It's like a what if. And the author is deeply, deeply concerned about how problematic it might be to imagine an alternate history where the American colonies never achieved independence from the steam-powered British Empire. <laughs> Quote, what leads to the question I'd like to explore here? Why is the concept of the United States as a colonized America so appealing to steampunks? Is this notion damaging to steampunks of color? S <laughs> SOCs? <laughs> SOC. <laughs> you can never keep up. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I I'm sorry if I said person of color. It it it's steampunks of colors. Got it. SOCs whose histories are negatively intertwined with the realities of colonialism? Does the idea of a colonial America promote or denounce the imperialism that existed during the Age of Empire? A critical question for our day. If the United States of America had never successfully won its war for independence, would the Charles Dickens costume characters flying around on steam-powered jetpacks with scraps of metal attached to their bodies be more or less woke concerning the problem of colonialism for POC, oh, oh I'm sorry, SOCs, steampunks of color, inquiring minds want to know. Eileen, the peacemaker continues thoroughly with some possible theories on the historic colonization of the American colonies under British imperial rule. Theory 1, Anglophilia. Pretty much, Americans are a bunch of weebs for British stuff instead of weebs for Japanese stuff. Americans envision British culture as being more intelligent, more polite, and more dignified than our own, plus those charming accents never hurt. Man, just reading that made me want to bake an apple pie like Mom used to make, just so I could watch General Washington and Lafayette splat it into General Cornwallis's face as part of a Three Stooges routine. America intensifies. Good tea. To lend support to her thesis, Eileen, the peacemaker, quotes from Corey Gross's essay, Varieties of Steampunk Experience, in Steampunk Magazine, Issue 1. 
nostalgic steampunk revels, much like Victoriana itself, in the elegance and the spectacle of the Empire. It forgets, or chooses not to remember, the dirtiness and the imperialism of this same Empire. Eileen, the peacemaker, persuasively argues that this alternate version of history of an America under British rule would have to ignore the complex cultural heritage of the various colonies and the myriad of contributing factors leading up to the war for independence. There is also a second potential alternate history, however, one which does not romanticize the steampunk British Empire's relationship to its loyal steampunk American colonies. God save the Queen. Imagine a more negative steampunk universe where those steampunk Brits might look down their steampunk noses at the steampunk cowboys. Imagine the possibilities to critique colonialism by imagining a world where America was not the supreme geopolitical power. See, for example, Michael Chabon's The Martian Agent, or the alternate history of Steam Century's Mystery Games? Gripping stuff. Part 2 of Eileen the Peacemaker's Exploration of Colonialism addresses the question of how imperialism would have led the British Empire to treat the American colonies under her steam-powered iron fist. As Edward Said explains in his book, A Culture and Imperialism, as the conquering nation, England possessed a patriarchal attitude towards its subjected nations throughout history. Quoting Said, We, the British, are dominant because we have the power, industrial, technological, military, moral, and they don't, because of which they are not dominant. Guess we Yanks shouldn't have brought a steam-powered knife to a steam-powered gunfight, eh? Now that we've established the patriarchal nature of British imperialism, what steampunk fantasy would be complete without acknowledgement of the levels of institutional racism? First, there's geopolitical institutional racism. You think the steampunk Americans had it rough? Just imagine the steampunk Indians, steampunk Australian Aborigines, and the steampunk Chinese. Second, racial hierarchy within steampunk society. I mean, have you even thought about what the steampunk pilgrims did to the steampunk American Indians? It's not fun, I tell ya. Eileen, the peacemaker, then quotes a comedic routine by Eddie Izzard meant to critique the sins of colonialism. We stole countries with the cunning use of flags. Yeah. Just sail around the world and stick a flag in. I claim India for Britain. And they go, you can't claim us, we live here. 500 million of us. Do you have a flag? We don't need a bloody flag. It's our country, you bastard. No flag, no country. You can't have one. That's the rules that I've just made up. And I'm backing it up with this gun that was lent from the National Rifle Association. All right, this is comedy. The reason it is funny is it is explaining a continual theme of history in a blunt, detached fashion. Gun beats spear. I think this is the most ethically significant portion of Eileen the Peacemaker's zine. She is trying to make an argument about how the British Empire should be represented in steampunk fiction and even in the imaginations of steampunk cosplayers and enthusiasts. She wants steampunk to reflect a grim reality about how Western nations whooped just about everyone they came into contact with in world history. So, if you want a sort of nostalgic, innocent view of the world in your steampunk fanfiction, that's problematic, because you're erasing the plight of marginalized people groups from history. Now, I'm not into steampunk, but my argument on behalf of nostalgic steampunk stories would be, not every story has to have genocide in it. It is okay for people, as their hobby, to imagine a fantasy world without some of the grim realities of war. It's okay for them to imagine a happier world, where the steampunk vibe adds some flavor to the adventure. It doesn't have to be a thorough, world-building exercise.
According to the argument unfolding in Eileen the Peacemaker's critique of romanticizing Victorian England, Eddie Izzard's comic routine is being used not as just a silly comic routine having a laugh about dark subject matter. It's being used as a supporting argument. It is immoral, according to this perspective, to whitewash Western colonialism, even in fiction or cosplay. So, since Eddie Izzard's comic routine is being treated as not just a silly joke, but as a serious argument, then here is my question. How did the people without the guns get the land before the people with the guns and flags showed up to colonize the land? Were those the good old days when supposedly noble savages lived in harmony with nature before the West arrived to poison their harmonious societies? Or is murdering, pillaging, raping, and enslaving a tendency of all human societies, not just Western societies, whether or not they had guns? If romanticizing the British Empire for the purposes of fiction somehow contributes to a historical whitewashing of the British Empire's responsibility for taking innocent human life, then fixating on British colonialism as the great evil is also a historical whitewashing of non-Western societies because it ignores the fact that the world was not a utopia before the British showed up. The answer to Eddie Izzard's comic routine being cited as a serious argument against colonialism is, before the Westerners arrived with the flags and guns, the natives were doing exactly the same thing to each other with fists, and then rocks, and then sticks, and then spears, and then bows and arrows. Because I believe there is a logical basis for universal, objective truth and morality that does not morally excuse the colonials who killed or mistreated the peoples they conquered. But recognizing that murdering people and breaking stuff is a universal problem and not an exclusively Western problem means that it's impossible for us to try and correct what Thomas Sowell would call cosmic injustices. If you think we need to look back in time and try to right the wrongs of colonialism from 200 or 400 years ago, well, why not go back to 1,000 or 10,000 years ago and right some of those wrongs too while we're at it? I think the Assyrians owe a lot of people some reparations for impaling villagers on spikes. Eileen, the peacemaker, moves on to her conclusion and sums up her main points. The nostalgic ideal of a colonized America also risks sustaining a romanticized notion of colonialism that ignores the injustices of the past and how the ripple effect of those injustices extends to the present. I propose that Gross's contrasting definition, melancholic steampunk, as the interpretation of steampunk that SOCs should consider. As pessimistic as melancholic steampunk sounds, it is also a definition of steampunk that gives SOCs the opportunity to confront our histories, since we cannot afford the luxury of a nostalgia for the past. Do you have a hobby where you imagine simple, adventurous fantasy stories and characters? Well, sorry, that's racist. And if we're going to decolonize our minds, then no fun allowed. Especially if you're a steampunk of color. You can't afford the luxury of imagining a world or your OCs the way you want to imagine them. You've got to imagine what Eileen, the peacemaker, has deemed to be a more appropriate vision of alternate history, a melancholy, pessimistic world. And if you, as a steampunk of color, don't imagine your fantasy world in the way Eileen the Peacemaker thinks you should imagine your fantasy world, she thinks that is a deficient response to the sins of colonialism on your part. Eileen the Peacemaker quotes Wendy Muse's essay, Nostalgia, a Sport for the Privileged, published in Racialicious. I suppose that is the magic of history. We can imagine it as we wish. We can simply ignore the facts in their entirety and craft an imaginary historical fantasy world 
cater to our specific interests in complete ignorance of the plight of, well, just about everyone except for wealthy white male straight. Christian landowners, but for now, I'll stay right here in the present and imagine a better future to come. Wendy Muse can go jump off a cliff. I'm not into steampunk. It is the kind of thing I might find innocently bizarre. If in your spare time you like to dress up like you either live in Victorian England or a bizarre technological sci-fi world or some steampunk combination of those two things, and if that brings you joy and fun, then more power to you. If the world you imagine in your head is more pessimistic and gritty or more lighthearted and optimistic, I think it is your imagination. Use your imagination to tell the stories you want to tell or enjoy your hobby the way you want to enjoy it. But according to the casually bigoted, racist, sexist, and classist worldview adopted by Eileen the Peacemaker and expressed in Wendy Muse's quote, If you enjoy using your imagination the way I've described, you are either a privileged, wealthy, white, straight, Christian male, or you are a marginalized person who has, unfortunately, internalized self-hatred. If you are a poor, black, bisexual, Zoroastrian female who just so happens to enjoy fun escapist steampunk fantasy, how dare you, asks Eileen the Peacemaker and Wendy Muse. They are incensed that you would dare to use your imagination to inhabit a fantasy world they do not approve of. The only response you should give to people like this is to laugh at them, and then to point at them while you continue laughing, and then to roll on the floor while increasing the volume of your laughter, to catch your breath, stand up, and politely as possible, tell them to go jump off a cliff. Do not welcome these people into your little steampunk fandom. They will just spoil your fun. With that, I'm going to show you the bibliography for this astute piece of literature and the biographical information on Eileen the Peacemaker, a.k.a. fandom scholar Diana M. Foe. Well, look at that, a product of the American higher education system devoting her critical scholarship and intellectual energies to the pressing problem of colonialism in the steampunk community. This is truly a testament to our vigorous, totally not garbage tier educational system and the immense cultural value the humanities contributes to society, if ever there was one. I'm number one Marmaduke fan, and I'll be catching you guys later. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Remember, so much rigorum, so much warrorum, and so much tangentum. I love you guys. <laughs> Uh, hold on. Back up. Back up. As Edward said, it... Through... <sighs>